Hi, I'm Sylvie from HR.com and I'll be your webcast host this afternoon. Welcome to Building Your Employee Financial Wellness Strategy, The Five Myths of Financial Wellness, sponsored by Salary Finance and presented by Daniel Macklin, co-founder of SoFi and CEO of Salary Finance Inc. This webcast has been pre-approved for one HRCI and one SHRM credit. Please be sure to attend the complete webcast in order to receive your credits. If you have any questions during the webcast, please click on the Q&A tab in your webinar controls and type them in there. And it's now my pleasure to turn you over to today's presenter, Daniel Macklin. Sylvie, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, The Five Myths of Employee Financial Wellness. Uh, as Sylvie mentioned, my name is, is Dan Macklin and I'm the CEO of Salary Finance Inc., which is the US piece of salary finance. Um, I can see I didn't wear the right shirt today. But it looks pretty bad on camera, so I'm going to switch my camera off now. Um, but hopefully you should still be able to hear me. Great. Um, so I think what we'll cover today uh, is uh, a few things. Financial wellness is a term that, that's thrown around a lot. Uh, for good reasons, employers have a, a massive role to play in the financial lives of their employees. Um, but there are a lot of things that, that aren't necessarily, a lot of things said that, that aren't necessarily true. So in this webinar today, we're going to discuss uh, five myths of financial wellness and, and debunk those myths. And we'll also cover the vicious cycle of debt uh, that many of your employees are in and how you uh, as an employer can help implement a financial wellness strategy to get those employees out of that debt. We will have a and a at the end, so please submit your questions along the way during the webinar. Uh, my colleague, Sarah, uh, who's in our Boston office, our HQ, uh, is fielding those questions um, uh, and we look forward to those at the end. So, so please do submit those as we go through. First of all, though, before we dive into the presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about salary finance. Uh, we're a fintech company. We're underpinned by a social purpose. Our mission is to get 10 million Americans out of high cost debt and into savings. And we're doing this through partnering with employers. We're now partnering with over 150 employers to provide financial, well, uh, financial wellness tools and salary link solutions. Um, as I mentioned, we're headquartered in Boston. I'm speaking to you today from New York. So let's get on with uh, the myths uh, and let's bust some myths. Myth number one is that financial education equals financial wellness. Many people believe this. Uh, they believe they're the same when in fact, they are not. To better understand this, let's define financial wellness. We believe uh, financial wellness is security in knowing that you have enough money to meet your needs, allowing you to be in control and giving you the freedom to enjoy your life. It's not necessarily about being rich. It's not purely about retirement or any specific stage of, of life or financial need. It's an ever present thing. It's having the security to not worry about money. So how is that different from financial education? Well, we believe that financial education is in the head. It's knowledge and tools that you've been given to understand your finances. For instance, financial education gives you the knowledge and tools to understand interest rates or APRs or budgeting or financial planning. But financial wellness really is in the heart. It's about actual behaviors your spending, your borrowing, and your saving, and how they make you feel. For example, some people prefer to save rather than spend. And for those people, they may experience stress and anxiety when they're not able to save. Whereas other people are less worried about saving per se. And as long as they have enough to get by, they're happy. So financial wellness means different things to different people, uh, but it isn't just about financial knowledge and tools. Digging a little deeper, behaviors take time to change and they require a lot of motivation, just like working out, for example. And some behaviors may be hard to change because they're just too ingrained. Sometimes you need an intervention to force a change versus just daily reminders of something you already know. Uh, and the reason we're here today, I think, is fortunately employers like you have the power to help through the power of your payroll cycle. You can offer your employees financial wellness products that change those employees' habits, and we'll talk more about that later on. 
Just finishing up myth one, financial education can take years to change an individual's habits, if ever. Focusing on education alone may have a low impact on wellness in the medium term. If we look at it in terms of working out, it's easier for some than it is for others. We all know that we should be eating well and exercising, but for some people that's relatively easy to do. Others find it much harder. And simply telling people that they need to exercise and need to eat well may not be enough. But by providing them with practical solutions, for example, putting fresh fruit in the break room, you can nudge employees in the right direction. So the reality is that financial education alone is not enough to improve your employees' financial wellness. Financial education and financial wellness both have a role to play within your financial well-being strategy, but they are not the same. Now, before we go to the next myth, just to remind you to keep submitting those uh, questions for the Q&A at the end. Thank you for that in advance. Okay, so on to myth two. It's the employee's problem, not the employer's. Unfortunately, that's simply not true. Uh, and this myth is actually costing American businesses billions per year. There's been a lot of research on this topic and we conducted our own big study of this uh, late last year in 2018 in consultation with Dr. Annie Harper, a Yale University researcher. And we conducted a survey of over 10,000 US employees nationwide across different industry sectors. Um, and the, the survey was based on the US Census Bureau data to be very representative of the population. And honestly, the, the results were worrying. We found that employees' financial stress is affecting them both at home and at work. Um, so let's have a look at some of that data. The first thing was we found that 48% of employees are financially stressed. So basically half of Americans, half of your employees are worried about money. And in fact, 34% of, of US employees do not have any savings and live paycheck to paycheck. This stress has consequences on their day-to-day -day lives, including their working lives. So I'll explain. Compared with those who report not having financial worries, those who do have financial worries are more than eight times more likely to have sleepless nights. Now, obviously, sleep uh, is an essential part of life. We need a decent amount of sleep every night to be able to function at work when we wake up. Um, and according to NHS Safety and Health, even mild everyday fatigue can affect workplace safety and performance. They, they, they did a survey, their own survey, and they found that insufficient sleep costs the US economy over $400 billion a year. Let's just look at that in terms of one profession, uh, a truck driver. In a profession like that, a lack of sleep can have a hugely dangerous impact on, on the job. Um, and another study from Organization Science revealed that short haul truck drivers who were worried about their finances were more likely to have a preventable accident in the following eight months. Now, you may not employ truck drivers, uh, but you probably don't want your employees coming to work after sleepless nights. It's not good for performance. It's not good for workplace accidents. It's not good for customer satisfaction. And if you can cut out financial stress, you can go a long way in helping your employees to sleep better. In addition to being sleep deprived, financially stressed employees are distracted at work. They lose nearly three and a half hours per week while at work. This is what our survey told us. They're losing that time thinking about and dealing with their financial worries. For example, they may spend time calling banks or their credit card company during work hours because they need to dispute an overdraft or explain a late payment. None of this is helping their productivity at work. But sometimes those phone calls to the bank aren't enough. Financially stressed employees take an additional sick day, 1.1 sick days per year to deal with their finances. It may be that they're having to go physically go in person to their bank uh, to do something, or maybe they have to stay at home to take care of the child because the daycare costs are too much and they simply can't afford it. It's one day until payday or even just that the financial stresses have made them physically sick. But whatever the reason, your financially stressed employees are calling out 1.1 more days than those who are not financially stressed. Remember, this is half of your workforce, so that's a lot of extra sick days. With the sleepless nights and the missed days of work, it should come as no surprise, really, that 
financially stressed employees are nearly five times more likely to experience diminished quality of work. This can obviously be very detrimental in some industries. For example, in the healthcare space, there was a study from the Industrial and Labor Relations Review, and they concluded that healthcare aides experiencing financial hardship show difficulty translating empathetic care into patient safety. Uh, and I'm sure if you looked at your own industry, there would be a, a, a similar version of that. Um, so it's really this lack of sleep, missed days at work, it's impacting their quality at work. And then along with the sleepless nights, the distractions, the days off and the diminished quality of work, financial, financially stressed employees are nearly six times more likely not to be able to finish daily tasks. Again, obviously this can be detrimental uh, depending on your profession, uh, but at the extreme, if you're a nurse or a doctor and you're unable to finish a task, uh, that's not great for patients. But even if you're not in the, the medical space, this impact on job performance should be worrying you. And because of all of this, employees with financial worries are four to five times more likely to experience troubled relationships with their colleagues. Colleagues may become frustrated with the increase uh, in, in calls or distractions or an inhibi the inability to finish tasks. And while people are often open to their colleagues about their physical illnesses or, the, or their fitness goals, it's often very different when it comes to financial stress. Financially stressed employees typically don't share that with their colleagues. So it's difficult for those colleagues to understand the change in behavior from the employee who is financially stressed. None of this is helping you as you try to create the supportive, collaborative and productive workforce that you're working hard to achieve. And then to make matters worse, employees may become even more frustrated with their job if they believe that the income uh, sorry, if they believe that income is the answer to their problems. It's not, but we'll, we'll get to that later. We found that they're 2.2 times, financially stressed people are 2.2 times more likely to be looking for a new job. And that's not necessarily because they hate their job, it's because they have the assumption that a pay increase will fix their financial situation and they're looking for that pay increase. As you can see, these employees have issues at home and they're bringing those issues into the workplace uh, and the impact on the business is startling. Financially stressed employees, we calculated, will lose between 23 to 31 days of productivity every year compared to employees without financial stress. These are big numbers. These employees will change jobs more often, leading to more time, energy and costs for you for recruiting, onboarding and training. And again, these employees will seek opportunities elsewhere if they think that it will reduce or eliminate their financial stress. So hopefully I've convinced you that financial wellness is not solely the employee's problem. It's also the employer's problem. The good news is that you have a chance to help uh, and we'll get to that later. Putting all of these issues together, it's a huge cost, it's 11 to 14% of total payroll expense, almost $500 billion. So it's a, it's a huge, huge cost for a corporate America. Just to put that into context, if you have a thousand employees with a total annual payroll of $36 million, the cost of the business in lost productivity, absenteeism, increased turnover and training, et cetera, et cetera, it's between 3.9 million and $5 million. It's a huge number for a, a thousand employee company. So this may seem a little bit all doom and gloom. This has been 15 minutes of doom and gloom, but, but there is a solution uh, and it starts with you. You can help as an employer, you can help put your employees on a path to financial wellness. Uh, the crucial thing is your employers, sorry, your employees trust you to do it. The chart on the left shows recent research from Edelman showing that employers are very trusted by their employees, more so than the government and the media which actually are seeing massive reductions in the level of trust. And our research at Salary Finance, which is shown on the right-hand side here, um, backs this up. We found that 68% of employees feel that their employers care about them and their wellness. And 79% trust their employers when it comes to issues around personal finance. So that trust means you're in a position to help. 
Uh, and to date, employers have done a great job. You have done a great job at providing employees with traditional benefits, such as a 401k and health insurance. And you do that because your bulk buying ability of you as an employer and the hard work of you and your teams means that employees are getting a better deal than if they were trying to purchase these services themselves. By doing this, you help employees sort out good options from bad options, and you can reduce or eliminate certain costs or fees. So financial wellness is no different. Although it's a newer type of employee benefit, it's no different. Leading employers have realized that they can help their employees in this area, and they are already providing benefits such as financial education, student loan assistance programs, home uh, buying assistance programs, low cost loans, etc. And we'll talk more about these benefits later in the presentation. I should mention here that before I joined Salary Finance, I was a co-founder of a company called SoFi, a company that helped people refinance student loans. Um, and during my time there, I led the team that established relationships with over 700 employers, perhaps some of you out there today, uh, to assist your employees with their student loan debt situations. At the time, it was a brand new benefit. People weren't doing it. But now it's beginning to come, become much more mainstream and it's offered by more and more employers every year. So I congratulate those of you who are helping your employees uh, in the area of student loans um, because I believe it's a huge thing. And for that reason, a growing trend really is for uh, employers to assist their employees with other aspects of their financial lives, just beyond the traditional 401k or retirement savings. Um, to the point that employers are now helping with general types of debt, such as credit card debt and payday loans. And, and we will come back to that later today. So it was a while ago, but if you recall, Myth 2 said that it was the employee's problem. Clearly that's not the case. Employees bring their financial problems to work. Uh, it impacts em employers to the tune of 11 to 14% of payroll costs. This is big. It's a huge problem for, for everyone here on the call today. But the good news is that employers are in a position to help. You can help your employees improve their financial wellness uh, and your employees trust you to do that. Before we go on to the third myth, I just want to uh, remind you to keep submitting those, those questions for the Q&A. Okay, on to myth three. We have a mental wellness strategy, therefore we don't need a financial one. This isn't true. A mental wellness strategy can't be successful without a proper financial wellness strategy. And that's because they're too interconnected. Now we're gonna try and do a very quick poll. Uh, Sylvie, could we, could we launch the poll please? So the question for the poll is, for employees with financial worries, how many, oh, excuse me, my screen just went, how many uh, times more likely do you think that they are prone to panic attacks and anxiety? So this is compared to people without financial worries. For those employees with financial worries, how many times more likely do you think they are to be prone to panic attacks and anxiety? Sylvie, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, we're gonna wait for some responses to come in, some more responses. And I guess I'll give it another uh, 10 seconds or so. And I'm going to close the poll and share the results. Okay, so that's interesting. So most of you thought that on average people with financial worries would be roughly doubled or, or two times exactly double. They would have double the amount of uh, panic attacks and anxiety. Um, well, unfortunately, the, the correct answer is, is 3.4 times. Uh, it, it, pretty worrying numbers, um, but it, it shows that financial wellness is a major driving force behind a person's overall wellness. Those people who have financial wor worries are, as, as the slide shows here, 3.4 times more likely to feel anxious and be prone to panic attacks. And then very worryingly, four times more likely to be depressed and to find it difficult to, to carry on with life. So. These are truly horrible numbers, uh, but they do show 
the link between financial wellness and, and a person's overall mental well-being. If we dig a little deeper into the, the worrying numbers, um, in this graph, you can, you can better see the, the drastic impact that financial stress has on one's mental health. The blue bar, and the blue bars rather, represent those who don't have financial worries. So for those people, 14% uh, are prone to anxiety or panic attacks and 9% and to depression. But you can see in the, the pink bars, these represent the people who do have financial worries. And you can see that their levels of anxiety, uh, panic and, and depression skyrocket by three to four times um, to the point where almost half of them are, are prone to these things. Um, so I would assume that you would agree that these are truly alarming numbers that, that really do show the linkage between financial wellness and, and, and mental wellness. And it's, it's not a, a pretty picture. Um, so I think that that myth is well and truly busted. Um, as we saw in the previous chart, financial stress has a substantial impact on mental wellness. When it comes down to it, you can't really address one without the other because they're all tied up together. Let's move to, uh, let's move to myth four. Financial wellness is all about income. I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, I get it. Lots of people in the country are financially stressed. But we pay our employees very well. Many, they're all driving nice cars in the parking lot. I see nice cars and I know loads of them earn six figures. I don't think this applies to them. Unfortunately, that may not be the case. It may apply to them. And this chart gives you an idea why that is. The, uh, the survey showed, our survey, again, this is more than 10,000 people across America, showed that financial worries exist across all income levels. So you can see here for the people earning under $15,000 um, a year, 61% uh, of them are, have financial worries. But that number never goes down to zero, even as the income increases. Uh, and then if you go to the far right-hand side, you can see that for people earning between $160,000 and $200,000, pretty high income, still 40% of them are worried about money. And it's not just worried about retirement or that kind of thing. 26% of people earning over $160,000 regularly run out of money before payday. 26% of people earning over $160,000 regularly run out of money before payday. Uh, it, it's just a, a, another staggering number. And it tells us that income alone isn't enough to fend off financial stress. And pay rises aren't necessarily the solution to financial wellness. In a similar way, it, financial wellness um, impacts people across all job titles. This is a very similar slide going from the trainee on the left-hand side to the C-level suite person on the right-hand side. And you can see that people of all ranks have these worries. While it's perhaps unsurprising that trainees have the highest percentage of money worries, it's perhaps more surprising that as one climbs the rank from department head towards the C-suite, the money worries begin to rise again. You know, if you just look at the VP level, as an example, 43% of VPs are worried about money. And another slide here showing that both low and high earners have high levels, high levels of stress. Uh, simplifying previous slides to show that, yes, um, for the lower income people, they have more anxiety, more panic attacks, and are more prone to depression. But these numbers are still very very meaningful at that higher income bracket. And then the final graph uh, for debunking the myth that, that income uh, is a factor here. Um, what we show here, the pink line shows the percentage of people who are worried about money and the blue line shows the percentage of people who are running out of money. So the people who run out of money is a slightly less, uh, a, a lower number than the people who are worried about them. Uh, money, generally about 10%. Um, but even if you're not physically running out of money, you still may be worried about your money because you're close to running out of money. And that applies across the income spectrum. So reality for financial wellness is all about income. It's simply not true. Financial worries exist across all income levels and job titles. 
Uh, and before we get to the final myth, just, uh, just another reminder to keep submitting those questions. Thank you for that. Final myth, myth five, financial wellness is a problem for a minority of financially illiterate people. Again, this relates back to the idea we explored in myth one that financial education is the same thing as financial wellness. We know that's not true. Financial literacy is actually impacted by a mix of socioeconomic and cultural factors that shape our attitudes and behaviors towards money. Remember what we talked about, wellness, it's an attitudinal thing. It's about our behaviors. So to better understand what it is that's driving financial worry, we came up with a concept of a financial fitness score. The financial fitness score is based on 10 behavioral questions that we ask people to gauge how they're managing their savings, their borrowing, and their spending habits. And you can score a number between one and five. One being that you're struggling, and five being that you're prospering. We found that employees across the spectrum are worried about finances. Whether you're a one or a five doesn't depend on your educational level. And remember the financial fitness score is not about income either. It's about behaviors and attitudes towards money. It's also important to note that employees across the financial score spectrum find finances to be a scary topic and to some degree often don't know who to ask for help. If you find finances to be a scary topic and difficult to understand, it's likely that you're going to be having financial issues, which again shows why financial education alone is not enough. Let's just focus on the threes and fours for a moment, the ones in pink here. These levels represent the people who are building and planning. These are not the, the people with the most need. The financial fitness score tells us that these people are somewhat financially literate, and yet many of them find finance to be a scary topic and they do not know who to ask for help. Going back to the myth, we see financial wellness is not just a problem for a minority of financially illiterate people, it's a problem for almost everyone. In this graph, we show uh, people the percentage of people who have missed a payment, a credit card payment or a bank loan payment or a mortgage payment or some, some financial payment in the last 12 months. Let's look at the financial fitness scores in terms of those missed payments. Even for the threes and the fours, there's quite a high likelihood that they've missed a payment in the last 12 months. Now again, the reason being that they find finances to be a scary topic and if you find it something to be scary, then you're likely to avoid it, even if you know that you shouldn't. So the reality is financial wellness is a problem that most of your employees, or at least many of your employees are facing. The good news again is that you can help. Employees have a very meaningful role to play in reducing financial stress in the workplace and outside the workplace. Our survey showed, as I mentioned before, that 68% of employees feel that their employer cares about them and their wellness. And we'll discuss more about that in the coming slides. So just to recap the myths and realities, uh, the myths on the left, um, and then the realities, uh, I think they're coming through now, uh, the realities on the right hand side. Financial education alone isn't enough to improve financial wellness. Employers can help and employees trust them to do it. Mental wellness is often tied up with money worries and employees across the income spectrum have financial stress. And finally, finally, financial wellness is a problem that most of your employees are facing in one form or another. So we've busted some myths together. Hopefully that, that was uh, somewhat educational for you. Now I want to move just to talk about a vicious, uh, what is a vicious cycle of debt that many of your employees are in and to really explain our view at Salary Finance that education alone doesn't get people out of debt. If we look at a vicious cycle of debt, it starts off very often with an unexpected expense. And I'm going to illustrate this by telling you the story of a single mother named Susan. Susan has two kids, a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old, and it's the middle of winter and the boiler breaks down. She needs $500 to fix that boiler, but she has no savings. 
And as you probably heard or read multiple times over the last year or so in repeated studies, four in 10 American adults would not be able to cover an unexpected $400 expense. I'll repeat that, four in 10 American adults would not be able to cover an unexpected $400 expense. And Susan is one of those. Her only option is to borrow money to get her boiler fixed. She does not have the savings. Unfortunately, Susan has bad credit, so she has to take out a payday loan. It's the only option that she can find. And this means high cost debt, increased worry, stress, and depression. Now she's paying an interest rate of 400% on a $500 loan, worsening her financial stress. Her income is now less than her expenses, leaving no room for savings or any other unexpected expenses. And as bad luck would have it, this is just the beginning of a series of unfortunate events for Susan. She's hit with another unexpected expense and the cycle continued. It's, Susan's story is a sad one, but it's not unique. It's a very real example of how, an employee's, of how bad an employee's financial problems may be. And once they're in this vicious cycle of debt, it's very difficult for them to get out. They need to borrow. Their only option is high cost debt. It has a high interest rate and then they're underwater. Their income is less than their expenses and they just keep, keep drowning in, in that vicious cycle. So we just made it clear that many people are short of options when it comes to borrowing money. Um, credit cards are expensive. Uh, even if you are approved for a credit card, if you get late on that, and roughly 40% of Americans do get late on their credit cards, um, they're typically charging interest rates of more than 20% for unpaid balances. Uh, and if you can't get a credit card or a bank loan, and if your credit is not great, uh, banks probably won't help you. Uh, the traditional financial system won't help you. And it pushes many people to the payday loan end of the market which is charging effective rates of 400% or 500%. It's a, as we mentioned before with Susan, it's a truly horrible place to be. The good thing is employers can help through something that we call salary link loans. And a salary link loan is a low risk way to set employees on a path towards financial freedom. Let, let me explain how it works. Salary finance offers these salary link loans and by making these available to your employees, your employees are able to take a loan to pay off an expensive debt, such as a credit card balance or, or a payday loan. Um, so in this example that we show here, Beth, uh, an employee uh, is borrowing $1,000 to, to pay off a credit card balance. She was previously paying north of 20%, but now her rate through salary finance is, is much lower than that, down at 9.9%, and I'll explain why we are able to, to offer those low rates. Then through a, a simple integration with uh, Beth's employer's payroll system, the loan repayments are automatically deducted from her paycheck um, every two weeks, or, uh, yes, bi-weekly in this case, uh, by $40, until that loan has been repaid in 12 months time. Now, should Beth leave the company, the loan will revert to a more traditional structure with repayments coming from her bank account uh, to be very clear, the employer, Beth's employer, is not responsible for that loan in, in any way. Um, so there are big benefits to the employee, to Beth, and to Beth's employer of doing this. Beth is getting uh, a rate lower than she otherwise would. Our rates go from 5.9% to 19.9%, uh, application approved within minutes. And critically, the automated repayments are deducted from her salary, meaning that Beth doesn't have to remember to pay that and, and crucially cannot forget to pay. Uh, that's very important for her credit score. And we'll mention that in a second. Uh, benefits to employer, simple integration, zero cost, zero liability. This is not, this is not complicated. You get happier, healthier, more productive employees uh, with the benefits for retention, et cetera. So you may be thinking, how can salary finance offer lower rates than the other lenders out there? And, and uh, really, it's a function of the structure that I mentioned about the repayments coming back through the payroll system in an automated way. Other lenders, uh, there are hundreds and thousands of lenders out there, they have to pay for many costs in order to run their business. They have to pay for 
customer acquisition costs. So the cost of finding that, that borrower, uh, putting their loan in front of them, Facebook ads, Google ads, billboards, TV ads, et cetera, et cetera. That is very expensive. In most cases, um, lending companies are paying hundreds of dollars uh, customer acquisition costs uh, in order to, to acquire new customers. Um, lenders, other lenders also have to pay for fraud and losses. People don't pay the loans back, they lose money. Uh, and also some people take loans never with the intention of paying them back. Uh, they pretend to be other people, ID theft, etc. There's a lot of cost associated to that for a traditional lender. And then even things like operations. Most lenders have large operations teams calling up people to say, excuse me, you're two days late on your payment. Could, could you send the money to us? For that reason, those costs are high. They charge higher interest and higher fees. That's why you see really high interest rates for, for lenders out there. Whereas at Salary Finance, we don't have those additional costs. Because we partner with employers, we work with employers to get the message out to their employees about this loan as an option for them to be able to reduce the cost of their debt. It's, we spend much less to acquire the customer, almost to the point of zero. Equally, there is less in the way of fraud or losses uh, because we have the safety net of knowing that for as long as that person is an employee, there will be repayments coming back through the payroll system on each payroll cycle. And it would take a very bold person to try uh, to defraud us uh, by going through their employer. That doesn't seem like a very smart thing to do. So we have not seen any levels of fraud. Equally, we have less cost in terms of operations. We are not calling people up two days after they're supposed to have paid us and asking them for the money for the simple reason that through the salary deduction process, that money has come in in an automated way. It's come in automatically in bulk. It's good for us. It's good for you as an employer, and it's certainly good for the employee. So we turn all of those advantages to the employees, over to the employees through interest rates, lower interest rates, no fees, and, and more savings. And that's really our secret source. So how do we help? Well, we, we help everyone. And, and we've shown two uh, employees here, two individuals at uh, perhaps both ends of uh, the spectrum. Um, on the left-hand side, we have somebody who today represents about 34% of your employee population or the average employee population in the US. And for these people, they have poor credit history. They do not have any other options except really bad ones, including payday lenders. And those payday loan rates can be up to a thousand percent, certainly in the mid hundreds of percent, just really, really horrible numbers. Those uh, individuals, those employees would probably uh, be at the higher end of, of, of our interest rate, um, which is 19.9%, that's the highest rate, but still with an interest rate that is a fraction of what they were previously paying, it's a massive benefit, it's a massive saving. If you move to the right-hand side, this person uh, may have less urgent financial need, they may have a good credit history, perhaps a good salary. Again, this is about another third of your employee base, but they may have credit card debt, they may have overdrafts that, that they didn't mean to get, but they have them and they're expensive. And that debt may be north of 20%, in this example, 22.6%. For this type of individual, they would uh, be very likely to get a loan at the low rate of, of our scale, perhaps 5.9%, um, or in this case, 7.9%. So this really shows you that employees at both ends of the spectrum can benefit from salary link loans. Again, the structure of those loans helps them to get interest rates that they otherwise would not be able to get. So what does the road to financial fitness look like for these people? If you remember the, the vicious cycle of debt from the previous slides, um, it's essentially the opposite of that. And it starts with a salary link, low cost loan. So let's think back to Susan's story. If her employer offered financial wellness solutions like salary link loans, her situation might have turned out differently. When her boiler broke down, she may not have needed to go to a high cost debt provider like a payday loan. She may have been able to take out a salary finance loan. Um, and with the regular repayments coming from her salary, um, she's able to pay off that loan and importantly her credit score increases and we've seen really big credit score increases for for uh, for our customers for our members because um, 
and, and that's a, sorry, that's another one of the bad uh, things connected with payday loans. Many people take payday loans, they pay them back each week, but they get no credit for it in terms of their credit score because these are not reported to the credit bureaus. So their credit scores do not go up. Therefore, that individual does not have access to better financial products and they just stay in that vicious cycle. At salary finance, that's not the case. Credit scores increase after they take the loans uh, and show good repayment history. So with that regular repayment, um, credit scores improve, she's happier. And in this situation, uh, her worry, stress and, and depression um, decrease and her savings start to increase and she gets to the point where her income can exceed her expenses. She didn't get mired in that vicious cycle that we spoke about before because her employer offered her a better solution. So the realities of, of financial wellness, clearly financial wellness does have a place at work, but what's stopping employers from making it a priority? I think it can come back to the five myths uh, of financial wellness that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, financial wellness alone isn't, sorry, financial education alone isn't enough to improve financial wellness. So please don't think just because you have some financial education tools out there available to your people, that that's necessarily enough. It probably isn't. Mental wellness uh, is too often tied up with money worries. That is true. Uh, and employees across the income spectrum have financial stress. This is not just for the lower income uh, level people. This is for everybody. Financial wellness is a problem that most of your employees are facing in one form or another. But importantly, you can help uh, and employees trust you to do so. So how to get started? We wanted to close today with four practical steps that you can take to bring financial wellness to the top of your company's priority list. Firstly, you should download the Salary Finance 2019 Employer's Guide to Financial Wellness. We'll make sure that there's a link in, in the copy of these slides that's available. This is a 32-page uh, booklet, I believe, with all the stats that I mentioned earlier about the impact on stress at work and sleep patterns and not getting on with employees, etc. It gives you the, the tools, uh, or rather the, the, the evidence and the business case with which to go to, to uh, your superiors or your peers to, to show them that this is a, a serious issue. Uh, so in building that case, the, the guide should help, but, but we can help as well. So um, you can contact us, you use our tools online um, to, to see or to help you rather to, to show that this is a problem for your people, but importantly, a problem that, that you can have a role to fix. You need to find the right financial wellness solutions uh, for your population, not just, not just education. Um, that that may that those right financial wellness solutions may depend to an extent on the makeup of your population uh, in terms of age and gender and, and, and geography. Um, by and large, many of the things we've spoken about today go across those categories, but obviously an older workforce uh, will have different issues to, to a younger workforce. Uh, and, and finally, we would, we would encourage you to incorporate financial wellness benefits into your annual benefits enrollment strategy. There, there are a number of things that you can do. You spend a lot of time and money as a company on providing healthcare and providing retirement, um, but often some of that gets wasted uh, because people aren't thinking about those things enough because they're concentrating on surviving week to week. So there's, there's some practical tips there. In closing, I think financial wellness is a must have. We believe it's certainly the right thing to do for your people, it's the right thing to do for society. And from a business case perspective, it's the right thing to do for your bottom line. At that point, I would say thank you for uh, your attention today. I think we have some time for questions and we'll uh, seek the assistance of my colleague, Sarah, um, on, on checking whether those questions have come in. Thanks, Dan. They sure have. We have some great questions uh, from the audience today. So we'll start with a couple more tactical ones. Um, we had a few folks ask, um, how much does the platform cost to the employer? And I think you touched on it, but if you want to uh, talk about that again in more detail. Uh, 
sure. So, so the platform um, is free for the employer. Uh, we are not charging anything. There's no hidden fees here. Equally, there's no hidden fees for, for the employees. It's a very simple loan contract with one interest rate with them. There are, there are no origination fees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but coming back to the question, zero fees, we do not want to put hurdles in place here. We, our mission, as I mentioned at the beginning, to get 10 million Americans out of debt into savings. And we don't want your budget or lack of budget to be a reason why we can't achieve that. So, so no cost. Great. And then uh, similarly, a couple questions on, um, can you just talk about what happens if an employee leaves the company before paying off their loan? Sure, that's pretty much the first question any employer asks us. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good one. Um, effectively, what happens uh, in the eyes of the employee, they now have a loan with salary finance that their ex-employer has nothing to do with. So let's say there's $500 left, they're paying $50 a month. That employee now uh, will send us that money directly from their bank account. And, and we at Salary Finance have settled that up prior to the loan being dispersed. So it's an easy transition. For the employer, there's simply no pay for that individual to deduct because that individual does not exist anymore within the payroll system. So it's simply a case of there's 100 employees that are using salary finance this month. Next month, one of them has left its day and, and there's 99 deductions rather than 100. So when there's nothing to deduct, there's nothing to deduct. Uh, it's quite simple. It's then a one-on-one um, -on -one relationship between the employee and salary finance. Great. Uh, we had a couple of folks ask, is there any type of data from companies already using salary finance or products like this or anything that shows that um, it actually works or what sort of results we're seeing? Yeah, that's a good question. And as the months go by, we continue to get better on that. We've done a lot of research looking at things like credit scores of individuals who, uh, who come in and take out loans. And there's really great evidence to show that for individuals who come in and take the loans, their credit scores improve. Uh, and that's, that's including people who are at the higher income levels where, um, where those people may be using it to consolidate credit card debt. We're seeing that they are paying off that debt and then get that expensive debt and then more quickly reducing the balance on the now cheaper debt through salary finance. And that is having a positive impact on their credit score. Uh, similarly, at the lower income levels, these people who previously may have only had payday loans as an option are now, uh, they have a formal loan in the formal uh, loan system that's being repaid every two weeks through their, their employer. Because of that, they are seeing improvements to, uh, to their credit score. Um, so that's one way of measuring it. We will be doing annual surveys um, of the employees that we help to, to better assess um, to better assess these things, but but there's good uh, there's a lot of evidence already that that this is having um, a major impact. Um, in terms of this is not strictly uh, answering the question, but we have a Net Promoter Score and NPS score for the loan uh, itself, and, and and that's 86. So um, for those of you that know about NPS, um, that's an extremely high number. That's a, a an extremely strong endorsement from the employees that we help that this is a very meaningful product for them. Great. We had a couple of questions around the topic of um, whether or not employees will use this. One asking that um, their population is mostly white collar and while they understand the staff around them being financially stressed, they're not sure they'd be interested in loans through their employer. So do we, do we have an experience with companies like that? We do. And I, I think, again, that's probably, was it myth three or myth four in terms of the income? This, when we launch this within an employer base, we really see take up across all income levels. Um, and uh, maybe a, a case that's useful here, um, we actually, one of our employer partners is an insurance and, and, and legal firm, white collar uh, employee base sitting behind computers, pretty decent salaries. And they were surprised to see that about 10% of their employees took out a loan within the first six months, mostly to pay down higher cost debt. And, and these include people who are earning over $200,000. And, and, and that's been replicated at all of the uh, employers that, that we are working with, over 150 uh, employers in total. We're seeing, we're seeing that. And, and here in the US, we're seeing it as an average, um, about a 10% uh, 
take up of employees taking a loan within the first six to nine months. Um, more of them, sometimes 30 or 40% are engaging in the platform in terms of the content, the financial wellness, uh, and, and maybe looking at the loan, but actually a very significant um, number of people are actually taking the loans and, and benefiting from them. Great. Uh, another topic here was asking how is this different from salary advance or earned income access products that um, are out on the market today? That's a, a good question and uh, maybe something for, for another webinar. Um, I didn't mention it today. There are other products out there, various names, but things like you mentioned there, um, earned income access or salary advance. Th these are distinct from what I was talking about today from salary link loans. Um, these are products where uh, an individual has already earned $200, say, for working a couple of uh, day shifts, and they want to access that money today rather than waiting for payday in a week or so. And typically, uh, they will pay a, a couple of dollars, two or three dollars for, for that privilege of taking the money early. Um, at Salary Finance, we will have that product. We, are, we will be launching that product. We don't have it today. There are other companies that offer it out there. Um, but it is a different product. It, it is a very different product. The, the biggest difference is, is in the use case. Uh, for earned income, it's typically much smaller dollar value, sometimes $100, $200. And typically it's used to pay for unexpected expenses or just regular bills that are due before the next paycheck comes. And this can help them to avoid overdraft fees or having to re resort to those horrible payday loans that, that we mentioned um, and that regular repayment comes out of their next paycheck. But that's different to what we spoke about today. What we spoke about today were um, salary link loans for generally larger amounts. Our average is around $4,000 um, and typically being repaid over a, a, between a six month and a 36 month period, on average about 21 months. So this is a larger amount of money paid back over a longer period of time to reduce the cost of that monthly repayment. Um, so it's different. They're attacking to a large extent the same kinds of problems, uh, but I, but certainly they are not. Um, they do, they do not replace each other. They are not interchangeable. Great. I think we have time for a couple more. We had a, a couple people ask about 401k loans, um, how it's different from 401k loans. And actually, one person, I'll just read out her comment. It was more of a comment than a question. She said. Our employees tend to take 401k loans to cover debt. This is a great way to provide them with an alternative solution to digging into their retirement savings and losing out on interest that they may have earned. So I don't know if you want to just talk about a bit about how uh, the salary finance or a salary link loan is different from a 401k loan. Yeah, that, that's a great question because we hear this a lot. A lot of employers are, are battling with this. They're, they're going to the, uh, a lot of hard work to get people to sign up for 401ks. Um, they're signing up and then unfortunately many of them need the money at short notice and they're, and they're, they're, they're making use of, of the 401k loan where really the, the employers would not want them to do that. It's very difficult for me to say black and white that a salary finance loan is better than a 401k loan and that's, or worse. But, and that's because there um, are so many variables in this. Uh, it, it really depends on whether people pay back that 401k loan. It depends on what happens in the markets uh, in the meantime, while their money's not invested. It depends if they stop making contributions to that 401k, um, et cetera, et cetera. But in general, you know, most employees aren't saving enough. 35% of employees don't have a 401k. So they, that's not an option available to them. And, and if you look at the millennial population, I think that's 66%. So even people, for many people, it simply isn't an option. Even if it is an option, many of them, as we mentioned, are depleting those funds. Um, and and uh, I think I remember reading that 18% of, of all eligible participants um, within 401ks have a loan outstanding. So this is a, a pretty big problem. Um, the problem, the real problem is that 401k loans uh, can often cost the employee much, much more than the interest they pay. Um, so there's a few things going on here. One, they're making less of a return on their um, invested balance because they're just reducing that, that 401k plan balance. So they're missing out on returns, particularly 
in the market when the market is growing as it has been for the last 10 years. Uh, secondly, and this one's, uh, um, there's a tax penalty. There's a tax penalty if they leave the company before the loan is repaid. So many people are taking these loans, leaving the company, uh, and then not, they're not able to pay it back. And, and um, another one, this is a, a stat I learned very recently, 86% of employees who leave their employer with an outstanding 401k loan go into default, meaning they cannot pay it off within six month period of leaving. And then there's tax implications for them. Oftentimes there's setup fees, there's annual maintenance fees, uh, and it doesn't impact their credit score in any way. So, so for all these reasons, there, there's a lot, there's, there's often uh, a lot of stuff that, that doesn't really uh, help them for 401k loans. Um, and with a salary finance loan, you know, you get higher total investment return on that 401k that's staying there. There's no tax implications. There's no penalties for late payments. There's no setup fees. So, so it's a different product, but many employers are using it as a way to reduce that, um, the number of people using 401k loans. All right, thanks. Uh, I think we have time for probably one more, and I got this question from a few people, so I think it's on um, uh, top of mind. Can you talk a bit about the implementation process for a product like this? Um, there was questions around just level of effort, how long it takes, uh, those sorts of questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, really, it can be as quick and simple as, uh, as the employer wants it to be. The fastest that we've done it is within a couple of days. Uh, more typically, it takes uh, around two months, around eight weeks. Um, that's usually because there's a couple of legal documents in there and, and uh, let's hope there's no lawyers listening in, but sometimes they can sit on the lawyer's desk. That tends to, to slow it down a little bit. Um, but the implementation itself is, is pretty light. Uh, there are two, two parts to it. There's one part up front when somebody applies for a loan, we need to verify that that individual is in fact a um, employee of, of your organization. So there's a way that we do that. It, it's all done uh, with the utmost respect for the, the data. We do not, we do not um, have access to employee data until we need it, until somebody applies and only the information that we're verifying. Uh, the second piece is, is the integration with the payroll system. Uh, there's various ways that we do that. There's more proactive ways that take a little bit more time to set up in the short term, but then mean that the ongoing process is two to three minutes on our, every payroll cycle. Um, then there's some other ones where we can we can implement more quickly, uh, and maybe it's a slightly more manual process that will then move to a more automated one. Um, it really depends on on the employer how quickly they want to get this in and, and their own particular payroll system. I would close just by saying that we. We've started working with over 150 employers and we're still working with over 150 employers. Not one employer has left us. I think that's testament to two things. One, the value that their employees are getting, the savings they're getting, but two, the ease of which uh, salary finance was able to be integrated and on an ongoing basis uh, utilized by the, by the employer through that payroll system. All right. Great. If we, if we didn't get to your question, we will follow up and, and answer via email, but uh, I think we hit on most of the, the main ones, so you can go ahead and wrap up, Dan. So thank you everyone for your time and attention today. Uh, we're just about to wrap up within the hour, so that, that's a pretty good planning on our part. I hope it was useful. I think the summary really is that you have a huge role to play in the lives of your employees' financial wellness. Um, this is something that maybe 10 years ago perhaps wasn't a thing, but I, I, I believe very, very strongly that employers can play a huge role in this. And, and if you um, are interested to learn more, then please contact us and we'll be excited to talk you through the different options that you have. Thank you for your time today. And we'll hand back to Sylvie. Sylvie? Well, thank you very much um, to our sponsor, Salary Finance, and to our presenter, Daniel Macklin, and uh, to Sarah Rib. Revson, who is helping him out there for presenting this educational uh, webcast today. I'd like to also thank our audience for joining us. If you'd like to view this webcast again, the recording will be available from our archives. We'll be sending you an email with your credit information. It will also be avail available to you from your View My Credits page of your membership profile. Our free members now have unlimited access to watch all of our live and archive webcasts and virtual events. 
uh, you are able to collect up to five HRCI and SHRM credits each month. If you watch more than five webcasts a in a month, your credits will be banked. To unlock and redeem your extra credits, upgrade to our recertification program. Your feedback is important to us, so please take a moment to fill out the exit survey that opened in a new that will open in a new browser page on your computer. I also included a link in the chat. This concludes our webcast. Enjoy the rest of your day.